the point of this presentation, yeah, spillway erosion, erodibility parameters, evaluating an erodibility study that was performed, um, but the main purpose of this was to kind of walk through what we call a RID process. So this is a risk-informed design. So we do our, our SQRAs and our maybe quantitative risk assessments to evaluate and rack and stack our projects and identify which ones need to go into a modification study. Once we get into those mod studies, we do risk assessments on the construction and on the construction design. And then we do what's called uh, after action, like we do a risk assessment after the thing's been built, you know, with the as built components, and then make sure that the whole project is fitting within our overall risk um, risk process and that we're not inadvertently communicating risk or changing the risk of a project. And, and that's something that is real, right? You do a modification to a project, you change hydraulics, you change flows, you transfer risk around that you may not consider in design. The other part I'd like to point out here is that in engineering design, you do risk assessments all the time. You just don't necessarily document that process or you don't communicate the thought process. But, but in my experience, doing just engineering design, you're thinking about how it's gonna behave and how it's gonna help or, or um, downstream or upstream components or how it's gonna possibly behave over loading conditions. So we, we talk about this risk, but, but you all do it all the time, every day in our lives. It's just a matter of how we document, present, right? Okay, so Thule River, so here we go. Learning objectives for this presentation, uh, through the Thule River uh, spillway design process, we applied this RID application and we're gonna walk through the, the evolution and why and where and how it helped and how it could have been better. Uh, describe how having a better understanding of site conditions, estimating the risk of the initially proposed design. This helped us optimize features um, ahead of it going into final design and contracting, at least for a part of the project. And I'll point out that there's some flaws in our timing and how this all evolved. Outline here, background, geomorphic, geologic studies, the RID process, we'll talk a little bit about how we implement it and what, what its criteria is. Um, some of you, I mean, eventually even consultants probably will start to evolve into doing these as well, whether for FERC or for us or whatever. Um, history of the site and how it applies to the design, what happened during the PA, original risk assessment, the IES, these other, and then we'll follow up. So background. Thule River. So this is also one of these challenging ones because it was originally called Richard L. Schaefer Dam when it was first built. It got changed to Success Dam. Um, which ended up being a little bit of an irony because it had humongous like liquefaction conflicts and issues. And Tom, Tom was probably part of that stuff a long time ago. Anyway, because of that probably, they changed the name to Thule River. <laughs> Thule River is located outside of Porterville in the Central Valley of California. Bakersfield is just to the south, um, I don't know, 40, 50 miles or so. And it is composed of an embankment dam with an outlet structure on the right, low level outlet on the right side, and the spillway cut into a notch into a ridge on the far right, on the far right, it's detached off of the right abutment. Okay, so way back in 2015, we did what was called at this point a baseline risk assessment. This was kind of like our screening risk assessment tool, maybe a little bit more advanced. I'd never heard of the BRA before, but um, the outcome from this risk assessment told the, the core that we had, um, we had a project that the total risk plotted up above our TRG, our, our total risk guidelines and pretty close to individual risk. So this is a pretty high, high priority project and it was driven by overtopping, primarily overtopping and then there's a bunch of internal erosion failure modes and some other failure modes. So we're at a DSAC 2, which is kind of a high priority structure. Yes? I heard this like the same thing as the PA, SPR. I 
think it's more, I think it's a little more advanced than the SPRA. And I don't know if any of my colleagues, you guys heard of a BRA before, or was this sort of at the beginning of all this? And it's one of the first ones, right? So the SPRA probably identified this as a target, and then it went into these risk assessments. So it's probably like a PA, S SQRA, would you guys say? This is this evolved into eventually yeah. Now. Okay, so yeah, because it was at the beginning of this whole process that's been evolving, I think is the name. So it's just semantics, I believe. So, okay, so anyway, it's hydrologically deficient, um, driven by overtopping. So uh, the decision the action item was to perform a mod study and evaluate how to reduce the overtopping risk. That's the, that's the decision making process. What that entailed was after the hydrologic analysis for the basin, update all that, um, this ended up being uh, a spillway mod. So the, we were gonna widen the spillway channel and then increase the spillway crest and increase the height of the control structure by, excuse me, 10 feet with a new uh, arched OG weir with apron and training walls uh, across, that, uh, across that detached cut on the right abutment. Um, I would point out that when this RID process came up, this is in 2019, it preliminarily came out as a guidance. And by the time we were able to get it engaged in some of these projects that were happening at the district levels, some of the designs had already been developed and they were all be ready being kind of pushed out through contracting and all that. So I have in green phase one, which was to widen the spillway channel by about 120 feet, making a new cut on the right side of the spillway, right side. <laughs> and this had already been designed. This had already been sent through contracting and approval. And this, this was an immovable object <laughs> at the time this RID process came about for, for Thule. So there's two parts of this, and, and part of it got the RID uh, uh, application, part of it did not. Okay, so here's the layout for the project. There's the embankment and the low level outlet on the lower right. Uh, we're detached cut spillway on um, 750 feet or so, and it's cut into this rock slope by 140 to 130 feet depths. It's got a natural drainage swales. You can see over here downstream and then a re-entrant ch channel. So this was the natural drainage channel through here and um, down in here as well, we'll have some information that kind of feeds our erodibility study. The other thing note too, is that there's these high, high capacity power lines and these large towers. So there, there was some conflict with respect to making the enlargement come this way or the widening go that way because of those features. There's some photos of the sill and the control structure. If you're looking downstream, it has, um, socketed into rock, uh, I think it's about six feet into rock, has an OG type overflow, and it comes up onto the abutments for the abutment control. During construction on the left abutment, they're making us slopes at about one to one in this rock, and they have some slab failures and some, some, some movement, some slope movement that occurred along two or three joint sets, there's one discontinuity set that dips out of slope on the left side. And so when they were doing this excavation, they had these, these, these movements rattling. Uh, this area kind of came down. They had to regrade the slope. They flattened it. And in this area where the slide occurred, they, they flattened it quite, quite a bit. So it had a weird extra flattening and some weird shapes on the left side. Just something to keep in mind moving forward. But other than that, the, the slopes held up pretty good for the last 60 plus years at about one to one. So here's this regraded area where the slab failure, where the rock slab failure came out. Um, land view, this is where the kinematic slab came out. And then the slopes are, like I said, one to one, 45 degrees, and they've held up quite well over the last 40 years. And all this cut was blasted. It was not excavated with wrap rippers, wasn't excavated with high pneumatic means. It was had to be blasted. That's also something, if you're doing erodibility studies and you have to blast rock, 
that should kind of help guide your your perspective a little bit. So um, back to back to some of what Justin's talking about, right? He, it's a lot of geomorphic evidence and features and methodologies are applied to understand what varied stream channels or fluvial processes or slope processes are in your project area based on how the geomorphic is how the geomorph is expressed. In my experience, it's the same thing with rock structures, right? So you can get into a liniment type study. You can look at where drainage is preferentially going. A lot of times, what's that, what does that tell you about the underlying rock structure? If you have a drainages coming out and following a certain path, they're, they're preferentially finding the weakest part of the rock mass. So a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times the, the drainage pattern in an old area photo or old topo will tell you something about the underlying rock structure. So those two things might have some relationship. So keep those in mind when you're developing your, your site characterization. Look at the geomorph, look at the slope of the, of the region, and you might have some information about how the slopes um, evolve based on the underlying kinematics or rock structure. So what we have is a spillway was cut through this original rock ridge the right abutment, there's um, no drainages that were cutting through this area. So that sort of told me that maybe there wasn't a preferential water path, at least when the, when the drainage systems were developing. And then downstream, we have what's called this reentrant channel, where the, where the spillway flows go back into the original drainage ditch. So this is an area where we're going to focus because in 1966, erosion occurred under these fairly low flows. They're only uh, 8,000 CFS, and then I think it happened for maybe four days where flow was coming through and we had some erosion occur at the re-entrant, and um, I can't remember the number of vo the volume of rock that was estimated come out of there, but that's where our spillway study, when we contract a spillway study, that's what they focused on. We had flows, we could back calculate stream powers, we could estimate what the rock strengths and rock erodibility was in this area, and then they made some estimates for us for progression and head cutting and, and frequencies. Okay, again, real quick, rock, rock ridge, um, spillways cut right through the middle of it, and the spillway control structures kind of at the upstream end. We have all these natural drainage swales. Maybe they tell us something about this rock structure. Maybe they don't. There's an original uh, dam aerial photo. This is kind of weird. It got cattywampus north. It's down this way. And here's the um, embankment. So the cut came through this. And you can see, again, in the old topo or in the old photos, you can see that we have these drainages that flow away. We have the re-entrant channel and the gully that formed. And winds weathering occur usually. You know, weathering is a profile from the ground surface, slowly decreasing into more competent, more sound, more fresh rock masses. So a lot of times in the gullies and the drainage, you might have deeper natural weathering that occurs into those rock masses. But once you make a cut 140, 130 feet thick, and here you're probably down below that weathering rind. So that's kind of the purpose of these geomorph slides is to, in my mind to show us that, okay, we may not have these really poor rock qualities in our spillway and in our spillway channel. Maybe it's downstream. So there's a three-dimensional aspect of this that we're going to try to pull into our risk assessment. Regional geology, uh, just California geology map, mostly we're in granitic intrusives that came up into uh, volcanics and some sedimentary rock, baked it, cooked it, worked it, pressurized it, made it into meta sediments met and meta uh, volcanics. So those are like the roof pendant rocks that are still, still intact and around the int intrusive granites. And then we have some of these also uh, basic intrusive dikes and other features that came up after the granitic rock to further complicate things. So the spillway was um, compiled. All the data that the district had, we started to compile it. The geologic mapping, it was, it was fairly well detailed, which is really handy dandy, right? You get 
some projects and there's no foundation mapping or we've lost the records or the maps are burned and are flooded at the project office or something like that. And other times you get lucky and you get detailed geologic mapping, detailed geologic um, notes, structure, rock structure, joints, discontinuities, foliations, shears, all that sort of thing. So first thing to do is compile all this, put it on a layered model of some kind, whatever software you use, just pull everything spatially together so you can start to make those relationships of where things are and how things look and how it's gonna build your geologic model. A pretty detailed um, geologic map of the foundation of the floor of the control sill. And you see here, there's some faults and shears and kind of busted up zone. And this was an area that was kind of identified later in the ground as having um, some possibly weaker rock material. So, and, and we're all in basically granites and granodiorites and uh, diorites. So it's generally pretty hard, strong crystalline rock. And you normally wouldn't be too nervous about having erosion there. But some of these faults and shears and highly fractured zones, I think, made the district a little get, bit concerned that maybe they would have some erodibility issues. So again, here's some of the site mapping, very hard, strong granitic rock sitting here. But one thing you can see, let's see, I think the sill, okay, the sill is right here. The, the control sill's here, that's all the geologic mapping from the original. And then the, the district thought maybe there was this weak zone running up the left side of the spillway that might be related to those shears or faults to some degree. So, the district then hired a, a consulting firm. Um, the consulting firm has is, is got a person there who's pretty well known in the rock scour industry. This is Mike George, you probably heard him, um, perhaps if you do a lot of rock study, rock scour studies. And they came in and started to do a, a pretty detailed uh, rock scour analysis following his methodologies and his observations. So they went down into these gullies downstream and saw the weathered rind on top of the granitic rock downstream and started to put, you know, K, K values, erodibility values on it. They started to look at previous, whoops, previous um, topography relative to the erosion that happened in 1966 to get erosion rates, head cut rates, and that sort of thing. Okay, so real quick, we're going to go back and this discuss the design. Uh, spillway layout right here. The design was to widen the spillway to increase capacity and then build a new weir with a higher crest elevation, 10 foot high. And the design already without, had, had moved, advanced forward where this, this right abutment cut and widening was already in contracting. We couldn't do much about it for the RID. So that was sort of ignored, it was off the table. Tom and I kind of reviewed it and we're kind of, to be honest, we thought maybe they could have come over on the left side, but it was too late at that point. So the part of the project that did get this, this risk-informed design is, is the weir. So a new concrete weir, crest elevation, flatten the left spillway cut over here. Um, and add a big apron, and it had training walls, and it had two drilled, so columns, I think 30 foot deep columns for two key, key walls. So this is the preliminary design. Let's look, take a look at what that looked like. So the arched weir, it's like this. Here's the profile of it. We have two deep cutoff trenches, 20 plus feet, and these are drilled with caisson and rock drilling caisson type uh, rigs and equipment. They have four feet of leveling concrete and then five feet. So nine feet of rock excavation there for this spillway design. So this is kind of what was on the table when they were requested to go through this risk-informed design process. So, but I'm gonna back up. <laughs> Prior to the RID being implemented, the the team did a semi SQRA in 2018 on this design. So now they've got higher spillway crests, wider flows. 
They can redo the hydraulics analysis and figure out if we have the overtopping issue. It comes out that now we have a lowered risk because of this proposed design, and we're down in the DSAC 3 range for this structure. Uh, summary of what RID is in the core um, it is to ensure that the design meets tolerable risk guidelines. So the, the main objective is that the design that is being proposed and we're moving forward with, like I said, doesn't transfer additional risk downstream that we didn't consider in the, in the, in the mod study, right? We didn't really look at the, at the risk of the spillway causing additional issues. And that's what the RID is supposed to do in this case. And also we want to identify vulnerabilities and susceptibilities of the proposed design, maybe uh, improve communication with the design teams and the risk review process. And we want to um, optimize the structure. In, in design, we optimize a lot of times based on uh, mostly cost, schedule, constructability issues are a lot what drive how we optimize a, 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 a project design. This tries to bring in the risk as the, the downstream risk, the risk to local populations um, in addition to the design optimization. And um, the, the benefit of the RID is really its scale. It's kind of like these abbreviated SQRAs. We go back in here as our groups and we crank stuff out. So they're intended to be really efficient and not, not get into too much of the of the, I'm gonna say weeds, but you know, take, take weeks and weeks to do. It's really like a day, two day sort of effort. It should be. Uh, again, here are the two phases, realizing I'm redundant in this quite a bit, so we can probably reduce. But you can see this is kind of the 2001 during construction, they're making this widening cut on the right side. Again, that was already in contracting. We couldn't really focus on it, so we're gonna focus on this the phase two at 35% design, which was the right, which was the structure, the walls, and the, um, the layout of the proposed, proposed facility. So then uh, SPK, the Sacramento district, implemented pretty detailed field studies, field investigations. They did a lot of detailed geologic mapping, drilling, sampling, testing, downhole televiewers, did some um, geophysics and some refraction surveys across spillway and up on the slope. All this was compiled in a data report. So we were able to kind of dig in and go there. The mapping, this kind of came from another project called Isabella, which is kind of close and it's all in SPK. It's all in the Sacramento district. And they developed their own kind of mapping concept or the granites that they had exposed in Isabella. And what they mapped based on was um, the degree of weathering. So disintegrated granite down to unweathered granite. And this is, their, this is their table they developed for Isabella. Then they applied it to Thule River. It's still granite and granitic type rock, so maybe it's applicable. Um, and to be honest, <laughs> just say it, it was really well done well documented they had consistency between geologists consistency between different groups of people doing this type of mapping um, they had cores pulled out where you could go and look at the highly weathered versus the unweathered and you could probably consistently be able to have different people rank rock this way the problem that i had and i think tom davison did too was that this was their own rock mass classification system. They developed their own system and it doesn't fit well within um, the, the standard of practice, which would be to follow other established rock mass classification systems. So that was, I just like pointing that out because um, it, to me it was a little bit of, it's, it's not wrong, it's just didn't follow standard of practice and, and we had some, we butted heads and had some arguments over that, but in the end, it doesn't really matter, you can still do what you need to do with what they've got. Just um, hard to argue that in a construction um, conflict case would be the uh, argument I have. So here's their mapping. We have, they have uh, these photos stippled together, stitched together, and they mapped everything based on the weathering degree. 
and the intensity of the fracturing. So they com com combine those two to identify weak zones that they interpret as being easily weathered. So we have a weathering rind here that's highly weathered and fractured or, or, or disintegrated, and we have some fresh, less fractured sort of thing. So they, they develop their own sort of weathering or erodibility grade based on their mapping of granites and their identification of the different granite types that would be there. And again, we've mapped on the left abutment floor of the spillway this kind of weathered material and highly fractured zone that might be associated with a shear, intrusive, or deep weathering, intense fracturing on the left side. And then same on the, same on the right abutment. So again, compiling all of their data, reviewing the logs, putting it on cross sections and going back through all the analysis, we keep adding data to our conceptual model and to our layered, layered plots. Did a lot of lab testing and we have the, the results of the lab testing of the unconfined strengths associated with the different weathering grades. You see here, it's pretty competent stuff, right? Almost 30,000 PSI down to 20. Even this uh, moderately weathered rock is almost 9,000 PSI. It's really strong stuff, hard, strong rock. So you wouldn't normally think of this as being highly erodible so far, right? And we do have these highly weathered, maybe shielded or highly fractured or whatever, and they're down at 2,000 PSI. So that's maybe a little concerning, but where does that stuff exist in this mishmash of rock mass that's in the spillway? So again, um, Mike George and his went out and they did all these profiles across that re-entrant channel downstream. They mapped out the weathered zone. They mapped out the extent of the flows that were going into these channels. They back calculated the stream powers. They came up with the roadability parameters for the weathered rock. And then they went to the office and they started doing all their analysis. And they, they're trying to put together a report. So in addition to that, we go back and look at all the refraction data. So um, seismic refraction has been correlated to ripability, and it's also correlated to rock mass erodibility as well, right? Remember from yesterday, ripability index is, is Kirsten's ripability plus some um, Barton rock mass classification schemes from tunneling, right? It's combo. So, so what they've done it, now, what we've got is we've got plots that correlate the seismic velocities to ripability and um, resistance of that material. And then at Isabella, they did a very elaborate ripability and erodibility study in the spillway. And they basically found that anywhere they had greater than about 6,000, might have even been 5,000 psi or feet per second in the granitic rock they would call that unrippable. If it's unrippable, it's probably not easily eroded by rock flows, right? Um, so we have this criteria now that if we have some moderately weathered rock and it's got um, it's at about 9,000 PSI and we're at these, these velocities, we may not have necessarily erodible rock mass. So we go then to, oh, and this is the, this is the paper. I don't know, down here I can give you the give you the reference for it. But that correlates, so the 6,000 PS, 6, feet per second or 85, 850 um, feet per second for shear wave correlates to about stream power of about 220 kilowatts per meter squared on these Anandale plots. So that's not an Anandale plot, that's the velocity versus erodibility plot. So. Anyway, then we go back to the seismic refraction data, and we can see that we have the 6,000 feet per second line is very close to where the sill is. We're crossing upstream to downstream on both sides. Section three runs along that left side, and we still have pretty low depths or shallow depths to that 6,000 feet per second. So it seems like competent rock here, right? Everything seems to be telling us it's quite competent, but, but the designers were still concerned about this erodibility issue. Keep in mind, Oroville within 
you know, years of this. And that district spent a lot of time at Oroville and saw the magnitude of what happened. And I think that had some influence on their concerns and maybe some of their design decisions for this structure and maybe for Isabella. So past, past events influence us. Um, but again, it looked like it was pretty competent. So, so we finally get the report back from the rock erodibility study and they do a lot of analysis. They present a lot of in information and data. And I, I feel like in, as a core, we should be able to start developing training programs to do the same rock mass erodibility. It's not super challenging or difficult. So we should be able to start doing a lot of the stuff that, that Mike, Mike George does. And I think he's agreed he can help, help us with that too. So anyway, this was the, this was the end of the day. This was the report we have going into RID, where we have this weathered, weathered zone on the lower left portion of the floor. We have moderately weathered and like, just slightly weathered stuff on the abutments. But this was the concern. This was the concern the district had. Was that there was this strip of highly weathered, sheared, terrible rock that was going to start to unravel down here during high flows and chew its way back and then tear out our control structure. So underneath, it's going to get under those key walls. It's going to take the arched weir out, right? So we had to do a lot more studies and a lot more um, convincing and discussions to get to a point of, of common, common ground. District also ran scaled physical models for the weir. Um, like I said, it's an arched, arched structure, which is extremely robust from a structural perspective. But the one thing that is kind of interesting and ironic about the configuration of the, of the weir, and it was based on the hydraulics, was that you can see this arrow is pointing toward the left abutment. So it's kind of a skewed, it's kind of skewed. It's not straight across the spillway. It's slightly skewed on the left side downstream. So what happens is the water comes off the weir and it gets forced toward the left. Well, the left is right where that, that weathered, sheared, horrible zone is on the left zone. So now we've even added hydraulic energy into the zone of where we think the rock is. So there's sort of these conflicting things going on from hydraulics and geology and, and you know, none of this got sorted out in time to, to, to do, redesign it. So another thing that uh, the, the consulting firm did for the erodibility study was they took the heck ras model and the CFD model and the physics physical model, and they estimated the stream powers and the flows all the way along this line. They did it for different flow events and at different distances, and they came up with their probability of scour and probability of um, high, high uh, stream powers exceeding the threshold of the rock. And they did all this fun stuff. Whoops, so, so in, the, in the report that we have, this is their failure mode. We have initiation down here, that re entrant channel. I don't think anybody disagreed. We have a weathering rind. It's exposed to wetting drying, exposed to a lot of rain. The granites will weather over time. They do. We see that all the time. It's an old channel. So, okay, no, no question there. We probably will start getting erosion at this downstream re-entrant at higher flows. But then we get the head cut has to go way back on this left left hand side, all the way back to the control structure. It's almost 500 feet of head cutting. And then we also then need to down cut under the design key wall, these 20, 30 foot drilled shaft key walls. So we need to get plunge pools and we need to get back at these, excuse me, we need to get the hydraulic energy down under the key wall so that we can then uh, fail the structure. But in the, in, when we get these rotability studies, they do all this, but they don't include the actual, what it takes to remove the apron, an anchored apron, a thick apron slab undermining of it. They don't include that. They don't include the head cut from the apron once you fail this wall um, to undermine the weir structure and then undermining their failure of the weir. So they don't include any of the structural failure in their rotability study. So you have to consider those 
those factors. They, they, they just do just the rock part. So that's what we're based on. Um, what we found after reviewing their document was that there is some amount of compounding conservative uh, assumptions, parameters, and values that come about in the rotability report. Some of these are, are obvious. So they use the stream powers from the peak PMF flows throughout all phases of their, of their rotability, right? So initiation, they apply the stream power from the peak PMF. Head cut and propagation, stream power from the peak PMF. Uh, scour depth under the key wall, peak PMF stream power. So they keep using the worst, you know, the worst possible scenario, worst possible hydraulics, each phase of the sequence. So you gotta think about that. Does that make sense? Kind of depends on the hydrograph, I think. So at Tule River, I don't know, we showed this, it's a really spiky last eight to 10 days, and it's a really spiky basin. So it doesn't seem realistic to use these peak stream flow powers at every phase, because in reality, if you're initiating and you progress, by the time you get to the end sill and that cutoff, you're on the, down, you're on the float limb of that hydrograph and stream powers are going down. All right, the left abutment spillway channel, that's faulted shear zone on the left side. They assumed it was weak core rock mass, um, erodible materials, and uh, that it was pretty much the same as what was in that re-entrant channel downstream, just deeply eroded, deeply weathered granitic rock along the shear zone. And then they also assume that this zone extends to infinite depth, right? So that weathered zone goes all the way down that pole to hundreds and hundreds of feet. It doesn't change. So this is all, these are all the assumptions in their, in their results. And this was a positive, really. They ended up with a, only a 3 to 6% chance that there will be on the order of 60 to hours of flow remaining after the scour gets to the end sill and has to go down vertically. So, so we're running out of water is what we're kind of looking at. And we have a lot of assumptions that the rock mass is weak and erodible to these geometries, spatial geometries that may not be realistic. So if the initiation downstream requires TMF stream power flows to initiate, we're on the, on the falling limb of our hydrograph. And the assessment doesn't include, like I said before, it doesn't account for the structural integrity of, of, the, of the weir structure. So at the end, after reviewing this, going through it with all the different SMEs and all the people involved, the conclusion really is that this report was extremely useful. It provided tons of information. We could use it to in, integrate it into our risk assessment failure mode, but it has a lot of, um, has a lot of conservative judgments and conservative assumptions that we need to account for also. All right, so I know this is, okay, let's get to the point. So now we go to, into the RID assessment. I don't know, there was 15 of us in the room. I don't think RIDs normally have to have that much. I think they can be scaled, but we, we ended up with 32 failure modes for a spillway. That was a lot. <laughs> um, anyway, we screened them out and we came with what we thought were seven kind of credible failure modes. And two of them uh, were identified as risk drivers. The one that is obvious would be that the head cut initiates at higher flows, right? Downstream in that re-entrant channel where there's uh, weathered, weathered rock, and we've seen it erode before. It progresses 500 feet upstream, undermines the apron and the spillway weir. It has to tear off a couple hundred feet of spillway weir slab or uh, apron slabs. It has to undermine the arched, arched, <laughs> arched concrete structure, which has robust integrity to span a lot of undermining, to be honest. Um, and then that would result in breach of the wear and downstream consequences. And then we also identified another issue that hadn't been considered in the design. This was slope instability on the, on the left abutment, right where we had that previous slab failure, that rock wedge fail on the, right, on the left side, that possibly during high flows, we get water pressures in that abutment, we can have a bigger, larger rock wedge 
come down into the right, into the left abutment of the weir, deform it, twist it, stress it, undermine it, maybe remove material from the left side, and actually we could initiate erosion then around on the left side where all that water, remember the water's going to the left. So this one ended up kind of being our, our primary concern. But so anyway, so here's PFM1. This is initiating downstream. This is the sequence of events. You have to have the enough stream flow power to start to erode that rock. You have to march it backward, head cut four or 500 feet. You have to get under this 30 foot spill, which um, might be difficult. Remember that the strip on the right was mapped as only being 30 feet wide on that left side. So that fractured, highly weathered material, it's got some width constraints too. But maybe it also has depth constraints in terms of its rotability. Maybe it's just on the surface that it looks like it's erodible, but you get down depth. And the geophysics sort of supported that. Some of the drilling did too. But so then following, following undermining of this wall, you have to road back. You have to tear out these apron slabs, which are anchored and three, four feet thick. And finally, you have to get under this arch weir that has a key. There's a lot to go on here to, to, to fail this structure. Okay, more or less likely, this is what we are gonna do this afternoon. You can pile all those, kind of bold the ones that uh, really jump out at different people as being influential. I'm not reading them. Okay, and then, okay, PFM3, let's discuss this one. So again, here's the old construction photo. Up here somewhere is where that old failure occurred. We could see that there's a lot of out of slope dipping joint structures. So there's definitely like a failure plane there. The, um, the kinematics suggest that we can get blocks to fail. And if we can get this small block to fail, is it possible we can get larger joints, more continuous structures, and we can fail a larger, a larger part of that rock mass during a flow water's coming this way. So this, this failure comes down, it tears out this wing wall, which is just basically concrete on the rock. It pushes it out and you get disturbed rock mass right here, right where all the water's flowing and you get undermining of the part of the weir, right? So now the weir has no abutting arch resistance. So, so you get some problems if that's the case. So we all ended up sort of agreeing that that was the that was sort of our bigger concern was that we had some sort of structure like that that would then, during high rainflow events, uh, impact that, that wing wall and result in failure of the left abutment. Uh, some of the kinematics and the stability analysis, again, all of the more or less likelies and um, what's influencing us. Finally, at the end, we get to our results and we are seeing that the PFM1, the head cutting from downstream, it didn't matter if we had the key walls, the turndowns at the end, it didn't matter if we had those in there or not. We did it both ways and, and you end up at such low, low potential failure modes. A lot of that was driven by the fact that that shear, it, it doesn't extend to infinite depth. It, it probably has four or five, 10 feet of weathering um, and then it has some limited width and to get under the key walls that are drilled, it just, it just wasn't really feasible, it wasn't real realistic. So it ends up that the PFM1 wasn't necessarily our concern, but it ends up being that this PFM13, um, without any additional slope protection or training wall um, structural measures, that this was going to drive the risk for that structure. We re-ran the, the risk assessment with an anchored, more robust left training wall where all the water is going and where that slope is. And uh, we can reduce the risk of that occurring down into a tolerable, tolerable zone if we take some measures. So these were sort of the major findings. The team identified that the concerns associated with left abutment slope stability um, and the abutment to accommodate the hydraulic loading uh, were, were, were driving the design and we needed to do some modifications to the left wing wall. 
the rat rock quality on the left invert is definitely worse in that strip and that shaded fault zone than than anywhere else on the project and uh we should have increased foundation um, approval criteria so maybe we do some over excavation uh and anything you can rip with a ripper you would replace with concrete spillway abutment and monolith rust block tie-ins are critical so if you have an arch structure all those loads there this is right up your house <laughs> If you have an arch structure, all those loads are going into the abutment once it's loaded. And if you release those, you change all the stress system in that arch, you get cracking, you, you can get movement, you can get all kinds of problems when you take away one, one of the abutments. So that was one of our key takeaways and also that's why the left abutment became a focus. And the, uh, there you go. It's likely that installation of the cutoff wall, those drilled shafts into competent 20,000 PSI rock may not um, provide the increased reliability or reduce the risk of the structure. And they're hugely expensive to build rock caissons to 30 feet in hard, strong rock. Uh, if the design recommendations developed during the the reevaluation or implemented the RID team judge at the risk associated spillway raise with those modifications would be tolerable. So at the end, the redesign, same, same, same weir structure, same, same geometry, same arch geometry, but it's anchored now. We've got rid of all the leveling concrete. Don't take out 30,000 PSI rock and put in, you know, 3,000 PSI concrete. But you do need something to keep the flows and keep the hydraulics and push the jump downstream. So we have only a two and a half foot thick mat, reinforced mat that is anchored. And then we have a small key wall at the end, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't get away from that. I, I was hoping to, but it really ultimately doesn't matter. That's a pretty easy thing to, to build compared to a 30 foot caisson across the entire abutment. So we got that done. We also then added this slope protection. We regraded some of the slope a little bit and benched it to reduce the potential for large blocks to impact this training wall. The training wall was thickened on the left abutment and then it was anchored to accommodate some size of wedge in that abutment so that during high flows, during high rain events, you don't have some you know, multiple issues going on. You don't have the flooding and slope issue that combined to cause a problem in the left abutment. Evaluate the risk with the new spillway design and layout relative to the original geotech and hydraulics analysis. Identify the costly design features, which were that case on wall, um, did not really re improve reliability or reduce the risk. We identified the features that required more robust design, so that's that left abutment. Uh, slope stabil stabilization allowed for better understanding of site conditions. Um, this was a good team effort. Everybody got on board. It was everyone follows the same logic and thought process, and there's not conflict in now telling a designer to change something a certain way. They're part of this process, and they were more than willing to get rid of the wall, which the key wall, which I was. I was really proud of that, to be honest, because of where the district was coming off of, like I said, coming off of Oroville, being part of that investigation and actually part of that remedial design and all the effort they did and the magnitude of destruction that they saw. You know, you I say you carry that forward and they were able to, in this risk assessment, get away from, you know, the more typical key wall, which is the defense mechanism against that process. But um, given our conditions at Thule, they came to the conclusion that it was it was it was okay. Everything was going to be okay. So, I think that's it. I got some photos recently because they're in construction right now. And you can see this is where the this is where the arch is. The right abutment's already been excavated, and the new road has been aligned up on that that right side. Um, they got a flood event right in the last couple of months. I guess in March this was. Um, Tule River was flowing. <laughs> There's a new lake in, in Tulare County, right? It's, it hasn't been there for a couple, 50 years or so. 
But so anyway, the, the thing that we're going to try to do is get the flows, get the stream powers, go back to that reentrant channel, and just back check the reports that were generated. And that's that. Oh, there's, there's the layout. OK. There. That's the end of that. 51 minutes. I didn't take it. Susie wanted me to make it longer. <laughs> you don't need to hear me talking longer. Set the agenda. <laughs> Just blaming myself for that. Yeah, we'll fix it for next year. So that was my that was my only knowledge check in this one. You know, where they, they want us to engage you guys. So, but there's questions, or we can discuss this. Is that an AE designer or in house? That was in house. In that. I haven't. Have you guys? Have we done RID reviews on AE designs? Do you know of? I, I, I would imagine we will be doing that. Yeah. Yeah, you need it early. We'd, we'd review it. The idea is we were yeah. reviewing. Yeah, I personally feel that, and, and this isn't a criticism, this is just how all things evolve, is that if we had been able to do the RID a year earlier, maybe, I think we could have got the widening onto that left abutment where the cut was way, way shallower. On the right, they were chasing the hill slope, and so that cut became massive. Um, so I think t we would have tried to push for the left abutment being the widening side, they would have had maybe time to deal with the transmission tower relocations. That's a huge issue, but I mean, I know we do it. We can do it. It's just takes money and time and coordination. Um, and, and also from the hydraulics side of things, they could have perhaps done something like a, like a what, what are those weirds that's at Isabella, the labyrinth? Um, that was something that was thrown out, but it was it was it was too late to change those things. Yes, sir. Uh, what erosion modeling software was used? Um, well, I, it's um, I think they use Excel at, at BGC at the at, at, with Mike George, but there is no rock erodibility software. We we have toolboxes. We have our Excel toolboxes, which use Annandale's method. We didn't really use Pels on this one. We, so, so, so the consultant used basically Annandale. So they follow, they follow the rock mechanics and the stream power calcs and they, they work it back, but it's not a model. They, they get their rates and they try to tie that into the hydrograph. Tom, you got, you know something about that? Oh, I thought you had a, I thought you were thinking that. No, okay. Oh. Oh, well, I was going to say, there's not, I don't, there's not software that models this. You can get to erodibility. We can get to the stream power. It's all kind of 2D conceptual stuff, and you have to merge it in as a group with experience to figure out the rate. And there's, there's, no, there's no rate. That's what we use to estimate a probability is that sort yeah. of 2D. And, and I'd say, too, the Bureau is working on something, and Dana Moses is doing research to look at how to use a CFD model to correlate that to stream powers and look at block removal rates and try to get there. And Bureau Rec is using FRACMAN, which is a rock fracture mass software, and heck, I don't know what they're doing, but they're trying to get into the, they're trying to build something, some sort of model to use, yeah. One tool we have used, and I'm going to give you a huge caveat because it's intended for design, is uh, SITES, which is now a component of Windam. We have used that on some spillway erosion studies, but it's very conservative. And so you can utilize that using the Annandale method, the KH ranges, and, and KD for soil too. Um, but it's not, it's, one, it's 2D, it's highly conservative, um, and you can use it to help inform your elicited um, values but you have to be very cautious with it um, because it's got a lot of assumptions that the team needs to understand. So that is one thing we've used, but it's not perfect and it doesn't get to the three dimensionality of the, of the challenge. Davidson in the back. So I was going to ask, did you ever go back and look at 
We can go back here and do it, but we've done it at a number of other projects. We've done it at Bull Shoals. Amy, Amy did all this work, and we used both Ann and Dow. This was really challenged, though, because we didn't have actually physical observation of the rock. We were using drill data. So oh, we, we tried it there, but that's weak clay shale. So you're in that intermediate weak, who, I was talking to somebody about Louisville shale. Yeah, like it's in that middle weird zone. I think there's a whole nother concept that we need to develop on how weak rock, weak clay shales erode because it doesn't follow soil. It doesn't follow soil and it doesn't follow rock mechanics, right? Plucking blocks. It's, it might be resilient in the moment of erosion because of cohesion and mass, but then it degrades as soon as everything dries out and then you start over. So it's, that's my theory is it's sort of more of a ratcheting erodibility process rather than a single event process. I, I don't know though, I, I don't know, find out someday. Mine'll. What were the drainage features under the slab? And well, uh, there's drains, there's drains in the slab, just. Just. Uh, yeah. No uh, drainage layer? I don't, I don't think so. No, I, I don't want to say it. I think that maybe the more advanced signs probably had more details. We saw that was great in Oroville. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I would say I don't know. It would make sense to put Robust. something to drain. Yeah. yeah. Get rid of uplift pressures. Yeah, so anyway, that's my knowledge check question. I, I didn't want it to, I didn't come, I didn't spend too much time on it. So the key technical aspects for erosion, that's what we're talking about. The, the three-dimensionality of the erodibility of stuff, how we identify what's on the surface, but what's really going down spatially, and how's that erosion going to work spatially. Um, it's a really complicated thing to figure out. It's kind of fun, but it's also frustrating. Um, and, and then you got to put everything in terms of the hydrograph. So. That was my big take home message here. And then working at projects like, like Garrison where the hydrograph is flowing for three months and you're never getting in there to see anything over that time period. It's, it's gonna do what it's gonna do. And um, if you don't know it ahead of time, you can't do anything about it. But a project like this is spiky. It's gonna be done in a couple of days. So do you have enough time in your hydrograph and enough power in your hydrograph, excuse me, to totally march your failure mode through the nodes. I feel like you mentioned that yesterday in your presentation on rock vulnerabilities in terms of like looking at your hydrograph and sometimes it's not the PMF it, that's yeah. going to cause the, the, the most damage because you don't always have that duration. So it could be a, a more frequent but longer duration flood um, that could cause right. issues. Right, and the, 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 the flows, thickness and the volumes change the, where the water energy is. And I saw that at Oroville, to be honest, once, the, once that spillway blew apart, when they had max flows, it started pushing the flow further down onto the competent rock. And it actually helped for a while. But then they dropped the flows and it started then dropping right at the toe and it started undermining. So then they had more unraveling at lower flows. On that on that structure, so yeah, and temporal long term effects. So good. Well, there you go. Made it. We didn't bore you too much. There's a question or an answer. <laughs> Any questions for Todd? No, no, I'm looking, no. At, I'm looking at Jamie's. Uh, uh, do not. That was a lot. Susie. I need one. Oh, <laughs> Jamie, will hit me up later. Well, we have a little bit of time and I think we can probably go to lunch a little bit early, but I thought now might be a good segue into something we've been doing um, in our office with some spillway erosion uh, racking and stacking. We've got a couple of people, Scott's like, don't pick on me. Hey. So myself and Damien uh, worked on two different teams. We assessed um, the vulnerabilities of 119 shoot spillways in the core portfolio. Um, last year, and then Todd and Justin uh, were both on our senior review panel, and it wasn't just us, it was a team of geology, uh, geotech, structural, and an H&H &H hydrology and hydraulics, um, and we would literally get on a call twice a week, we had a routine meeting for our team, I was with Scott Wheeler was our lead. Um, 
And we would spend four hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays going through several projects at a time. And if you want to know the pain and suffering that you did yesterday in your data review uh -huh. in the site model build, we had to do that times three twice a week. Um, not complaining, it was fascinating. Um, at one point, Damien and I would talk and compare notes. And uh, he said to me, why would the tool that we're using have soils? Why would anybody build a concrete structure on soils? And I laughed and I said, well, mm -hmm. if you're working in the LA area, every single dam is built on thick alluvial um, sand deposits. So every spillway was built on soil. So you can imagine the erodibility would be high and there was issues with, we had concerns about void susceptibility that all of this is tied into post Oroville. Yeah. Um, everything that we've been doing as an agency, trying to capture what we think um, our vulnerabilities are at our projects. Um, it's been, it's been interesting. Um, and there's a lot of variety out there. Yeah. And I, I mean, anybody in this room is going to end up working on dams. You end up, you'll end up you'll working on spillways over the next 10, 20 years. I think there's a lot of structures that we have out there that have vulnerabilities. They've never, flow they've never seen these issues and they were designed 60 whatever years ago and yeah they maybe don't have these elements this backup elements they don't yeah. have the uh, what is it the belt and suspenders that mm -hmm. we like to see um and we learned a lot from what happened at oroville um what was i going to say so at any rate there's a lot of work coming down the pipeline for spillways i think i, I understand the next batch is going to be all our unlined spillways Ugh. which are the other like what six seven hundred <laughs> projects out there it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, so what we've done is we took, uh, so Jamie Lopez, who's sitting in the class and he doesn't want to talk, so I won't pick on him too much, but I'll point him out. He's sitting right there smiling and laughing. Um, he was the brains behind the screening tool that we used. Um, it looked at foundation um, erodibility, void susceptibility. It looked at um, how are the different portions of the structure, the control structure, the chute slabs, the walls, and the stilling basin or energy dissipators were uh, constructed and did they have the vulnerabilities that we know about um, so in hindsight I wish I would have put a quick PowerPoint together but maybe next time we can uh, it's, it's a, vetted a and I'll, and Jamie's writing the report yay yeah he's like I'll be working on that for a while um, but that is going to help us rack and stack our shoot line spillways in the core to understand um, it's looking at it without the risk component. So we didn't discuss duration of flows. We didn't discuss population at risk or consequences. It was literally just looking at these structures and what are their um, susceptibilities and vulnerabilities. And do we, do we need to, as an agency, come up with a different process? I'm kind of curious about this next part myself, thinking ahead, what are we going to do with this? Um, it might insert itself into the risk process to maybe do some improvements at some of these uh, more worrisome structures. So I think the worst one was Prado Dam. Is that right, Jamie? Mm -hmm. Or did somebody? Somebody beat it. Somebody beat Prado. That's scary, because Prado is built on some pretty crummy rock. We're talking about, Justin knows all about the joys of Prado. Um, <laughs> it's pretty scary. But we're in, uh, in the design phase to rebuild that, essentially, and put the belt and suspenders um, on that structure. So who was worse? Who is the worst one? Okay, he's like, don't give away all the secrets. <laughs> Perhaps something to mention is that after after the, this review is done, so, so after after this review is done, uh, the expectation is that uh, the districts can provide feedback regarding uh, the work that we did. Uh, perhaps they can provide feedback into things that uh, we may have missed or that um, we didn't correctly address. So um, probably some of the people that are here taking uh, the course today uh, will be involved in that. Uh, so whenever they um, people start looking at the results, uh, we, we, we're going to need uh, everybody's feedback regarding uh, the work that we did and to make sure that um, that's exactly what you have in your spillway. So. Yep, one of the things Todd mentioned uh, in his talk yesterday too was, and he used a slightly different term, but we talk about like there's life safety risk and then there's reputational risk. And so these spillways, it's difficult as Todd pointed out yesterday, you can't get a lot of incremental life loss consequences out of them typically, but 
everyone knew about Oroville when it happened, even if you didn't know anything about dams. Um, so it was, it kind of set people moving forward because reputational risk sounds a little corny, but it's, it's an important thing to consider. Yeah. And it's a different, it's different than what we've been doing. Yeah. And, and at Oroville, they, they, they evacuated downstream, assuming that the only models they had were for the full dam breach. So 250,000 people were evacuated when that spillway was going. And um, the consequence people are really interesting when they get going on this. But if somebody, people die during ex uh, evacuations, right? Heart attacks or they get yep. stuck or stuff happens. So there could have been, that did not happen. Those are just consequences of evacuations. And was there? Uh, yeah. And so that's directly related to probably the, the evacuation. And then did they need to evacuate 250,000 or it could have been 60 or 30 or whatever. So one of the things we're trying to do to Todd's point is to improve our um, inundation maps to show spillway flows and different levels of releases to have a better, a finer detail on those evacuations. So the sheriff and the EMAs don't they evacuate. make decisions. It's yeah, not, be a little more informed yeah. on their end. So, any thoughts from the other instructors? I don't really want that thing, but I know I'm gonna keep bringing it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, I was gonna say that one of the hard things about it is um, so spillway erosion is very much a nonlinear thing, right? Mm -hmm. So. Like you said, at some low flows, sometimes you get a, a, a higher jet, like it impacts the rock um, more badly. <laughs> and angry water flows, it shoots over and like hits some other places that are, you know, it's not as, not as bad and that's not intuitive to me. Um, and then also it's really hard because we're trying to project like what the behavior will be at these flows that nobody ever sees. Like, you know, 1.5 million CFS, something through a spillway is like, it's like DEFCON 1, right? You yeah. never have that. So to try and predict what the nonlinear, you know, behavior is going to be is really hard. And, and almost one of my questions for you on this was, you know, maybe there is um, some other places, you know, with that similar weathered rock that experience like a different flow or more flow. And that's almost like I was getting back to your question about like software, like how do you how do you predict what the behavior would be? And it's almost like case histories would be a good example if those flows existed and if you could say the rock was similar from there to there to you know anywhere else um but yeah it's a it's a challenge um i have another one later tomorrow where we'll talk nice. about more spillway sensitive i i mean you you talk about the rock mechanics part we can look at a rock mass and we can kind of judge the Rotability, the KH or the EGSI, we can do that with plots and graphs. And there's there's a lot of data where you have a picture of the spillway and a picture of the rock, and you can see what the KH is. So you can put that into a physical perspective. We don't have that for for stream power. I was hoping to work with some of the stream power, the hydraulics folks, and come up with videos or photos of where water is in different flow regimes, where water is is got energy focused in the rock and then have a stream power. Is it 10? Is it one? Is it a thousand? Because that connection, even with hydraulics folks, doesn't, they don't, they can't look at a flow or a model or a whatever and say, oh, well, that's, that's 10 kilowatts per meter square. Cause it's a weird number. <laughs> I was hoping to kind of build that database where you could compare and you just get some physical tangible evidence of what those values mean. I don't know if we'll get there or not. <laughs> yeah, Tesville, Hawaii. Everybody's invited. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a note off Prado Dam and the spillway. Uh, me and the Louisville Cadre spent uh, several years looking at that for the risk assessment. And uh, we wrote a paper for ASDSO uh, last year about that, uh, 2022. So if you're interested to read about the risk assessment for the Prado spillway and how we handled not only the unique geology of the foundation, but really the the um, the non-contemporaneous design, which means, you know, no defensive measures in the spillway, no anchors in the slabs, no reinforcement across slabs. Um, you can look that up. That should be online. It's uh, Pierce et al. 2022. Yeah, Justin, also you were part of the, the pipe stem design as well, and that, that remedial measure. Yeah, the pipe stem is... Pipe stem was really interesting, you know, because it's basically an unlined spillway on glacial 
drift with sand on top of it. Um, so we were predicting, you know, pretty much instantaneous erosion. And the question was, you know, it's a long spillway, it's over a mile long. And the question really became is, you know, yeah, how fast will it get up there and will it get up there? And mm -hmm. like Damien was saying, you know, there's a lot of complexities and nuances, uh, hydraulically, geologically, geomorphically about, you know, head cuts progress and, you know, nonlinear response. And, you know, it's a lot of uncertainty in that one. Absolutely. Nice. I have the one, I'm, I'm going to keep going. I don't know a lot of time, but so one thing from the spillway review, uh, these guys can comment on that as well is, uh, we have some spillways up in the, up in the Northern part of the country that, um, are huge spillways. They're, they're robust. They're three, four foot thick slabs with anchor bars that are like this big. And they're, they're in some crummy rock sometimes and some shales, clay shales. The designers back in the day, they put this big thing of five foot frost blanket underneath to alleviate the potential for frost and permafrost from damaging the slabs, lifting and distressing the slabs. And I think that was probably a smart idea in that moment. But but what we're finding is this huge thing. That's your foundation now is sand in these huge things that that also have this in underground internal drainage plumbing system that's just super elaborate, really big, and deteriorated. So now where's the sand going? Can water get down in when a manhole comes popping off? You charge the whole system, you have holes in your pipe system, you just flush sand who knows where, and you undermine these slabs. And so now we have a huge headache to deal with these because structurally they're awesome. But this sand layer is going to kill, kill these, not kill the project, but create, <laughs> create like an alternative and how you repair it. Do you tear it out, start over? Do you, what it's, it's a, I have no idea. Yeah. So as, as you know, Todd, uh, those type of structures with the sand blankets get scored very poorly in our spillway screening, yeah. uh, sinking to the bottom very quickly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think, I mean, there's more work. That we can do in the next 10 years up there 20 years so study spillways <laughs> oh all right cool well yeah complaints uh i think that one might have been uh utah yeah but erdic does them bureau does them Utah State, I think Colorado, CSU might do them. Collins, yeah, yeah, but that one was at Utah. Same, yeah. The photo one's over at Bureau Rex. So if anyone's in Lakewood, I think it's still there. Yeah, they actually did a physical model in the 30s when they were originally designed. Yeah. Structure. It's more about the flip bucket, dynamics of the flip bucket. We found that when we did some archive research in 2019, really interesting uh, results about how the geometry of the flip bucket really had scour and plunge pool and how it was focused. I mean, it's a really interesting, really interesting still here because it's parabolic, right? It's not a linear wall structure, it's parabolic. So what ends up happening is you get for fraction of something, you end up with these crossways. Mm. And so there's a flip bucket. They found out that it's going to tap the left side a little bit more than the right side. So they had to put in a different wall and things like that to accommodate that. That scour, but you know, what happens is that uh, those crossways end up being really problematic because, you know, like I was saying, the street slab are not a not, you know, reinforced across slabs and the pit slab. So they're basically just like chip that's flying on the ground, right? And so problem number one, feeling goal number one is they have uh, uh, clay beds that have uh, swelling markings to them. The beds are going to still be a sort of vertical. And they heat up some of those slabs like a top edge and they so get that slab tapping. That's the base bits of the flow that was failure of number one. You get it, the, the, there's no water stops the water gets to the foundation and makes it pop those slabs off. So that was one, um, you know, PFMS 1A. PFMS 1B was how the crossways dynamic 
pretty he slash because they're not getting the damage. So it's you end up with this like fluctuating texture, because there's cross space, right? And it's so both like it's like drumming your fingers on the chips. They just there and they vibrate and then they attack. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, it was it was a large part of the problems that they're having that because they didn't really do what we consider like modern day design with you know multiple uh, defensive measures, you know, dick slabs, you know, reinforcement, water stops, anchors. So that was the problem. And then you couple that with the high foundation, which is a, basically an unsmented sandstone. Um, and that's just that stuff. But I think we gave it a number of them. It nests between one and ten, like really low. And yeah. that, that based on boring data and other kinds of field information. Uh, we didn't trust uh, epigraphic uh, studies of the sand to, to demonstrate that it has zero signification. So, so the only reason why they get any kind of resistance and penetration is just the, the lateral confining stresses. So we had a dog of hole in your sand for lateral, it's just false. Yeah. 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 I call that a not respectable <laughs> rock. <laughs> And what would be really cool is in those physical models, if they could somehow get sensors, pressure sensors, or whatever, and figure out, calculate what the stream power is, that would be really a useful application for those models or an added piece of information. I would warn, though, the thing I've learned, we, we've run a couple projects now. Uh, Keystone was one. Damien was part of this. The, the CFD model, we run these elaborate CFD, these 3D numerical CFD models, computational fluid dynamics, right? And they can calculate a stream power stat based on the velocity and density. It's not calculated the same way that the Annandale hand calc, 2D hand calc hydraulics are calculated. So you get numbers that don't, don't correlate. And if you get a CFD number, you can't use that stream power in the Annandale. It doesn't, it's, it's a different number. It's a different value. So I don't know how we correlate the CFD stream power to match Annandale. It may never happen because it's 2D versus 3D system. So I thought that was going to help us, but it didn't. 